Sorry, can I open my system preferences here. No worries. OS 10 does not like Zoom. There we go. Da, 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 da. Get our web browser open. I have way too many browsers open. There we go. <clears throat> you guys can see that? Oh, wait. Uh, currently, we're seeing Black that screen. you've started uh, sharing and that we should double click to enter. Yeah, it's just black screen right now. Let me get back to the Zoom. Yeah, I'm using the app. That's, I think I should switch over to my Windows box. Sharing is paused, bring your shared window to the front. Okay. There. Can you see that? Yes. So you actually see the web browser? Yes. Like, yep. like it's the EBF talk. Okay. Because I, I have no clue what I'm what, what's actually being shared here. So <laughs> okay. I wish I could see this, but anyway, if this ever goes out or something, just just holler and ask lots of questions because I probably don't know the answers, but could probably figure it out. Uh, so eBPF is something that Netflix has been using probably for at least the past five to seven years or so uh, on all their servers in production to uh, do most of their performance monitoring and tracing and security. Uh, started out actually uh, as part of the, the D-Trace project, um, which uh, Brendan Gregg worked on, I believe at Sun. And then, let me see if I can pull this up. There was a, a Linux kernel, uh, and this is, this is in Unit, Usenix, uh, the, the BSD packet filter. So it, it was a new architecture for uh, packet filtering. And as this got uh, more and more used since 1992, uh, people wanted more and more features of this uh, closer to the kernel, so there's less memory copies and whatnot. Um, so you know, packets could get dropped as soon as they came in automatically, and and all those type of things. And so, uh, let's see. Sorry. There you go. Uh, so this is the presentation of one of the guys that's a maintainer uh, for the BCC tools. He now works at Google, um, doing like machine learning stuff. Uh, Sasha Goldstein, and I think he gave this uh, workshop uh, probably like four years ago, maybe. Um, just go down here and he had, okay, this is a, this is what uh, Brendan Craig made this. <clears throat> and so here are a bunch of the, the, the eBPF uh, kernel things that uh, can snoop on various parts of, of the system stack here. Um, you have everything from, can you see my mouse? Okay. Yeah, you every, have everything from a uh, user space probes. So you can put probes inside user space. Uh, uh, kernel probes, um, you can spy on like the block IO, the file system, ethernet, uh, you can get a uh, CPO profiles. So you can get like a full stack trace uh, from the init of the kernel all the way up um, that you can use for profiling, um, memory stuff, uh, you know, how hot your caches are and whatnot. And so, but basically, almost anything you'd really want to get at, you can now get at uh, with these new uh, um, eBPF uh, toolings. And let me see here. Back out of that. Let me actually go to the um, the BCC. So there's a project here called the IOVisor project. 
and that's kind of where uh, like a lot of these toolings lived. <clears throat> um, actually, I'm going to get out of that. I'm just going to go to their GitHub repo. And if any of you guys are interested in Hacktoberfest or whatever, um, they always take uh, pull requests for good documentation. Actually, actually, a lot of these maintainers just do documentation. Uh, that, that's, that's Brendan Craig. Um, and so here's uh, let me see, put one here. Yeah, here, here's the more updated uh, list here. Now, BCC tools uh, takes eBPF. Uh, which is uh, a virtual machine that, that runs inside the kernel. Uh, you actually take C code and then compile it to this virtual machine. And the compiler is very strict. It doesn't really allow you to have loops. It doesn't allow you to have uh, memory that's undefined. And so a lot of programs will very easily uh, just not compile because they're too complex for the, it to verify. And so what they've done is they've taken eBPF and they've written a bunch of uh, Python and Go and C tools on top of it um, that are more user friendly to what you'd actually use as a, a systems administrator. Uh, and then here they have, uh, yeah, they have tools for everything here in the stack. And I'll, I'll go over some of them here. Uh, like one of the ones that uh, you, you see here, uh, they have, uh, and actually this is for, uh, for C, Java, uh, Node.js, PHP, and Python. They've actually, uh, stripped off the stack layers that you don't care about because they're in the virtual machine uh, for those languages. And so they now have a uh, language specific, let's see. most of these begin with a, they're, they're called something or other snoop. Let's see here. Just going to the tools directory. Uh, and this is really nice. They have a for each each uh, tool they have, they have a really nice uh, little text file. It's kind of like a man page of how it's used. Um, so this uh, this R dist. Um, you give it a the uh, function you want to trace, and how often you want to trace it, and it'll it'll give you a count. Um, and this is this is kind of nice because you can get like a distribution of say like uh, like at a logarithmic scale or whatever for how many times a certain thing is called. It's so like how how often a certain file is opened, um, you know whatever you, you know you really want to tie this to. One of, the, see, one of the ones that uh, block IO snoop is, is one of Brendan Gregg's favorites. Um, what it does is it, uh, it just looks at all of your uh, disk IO and uh, just tells you, oh, hey, you know, this PID, you know, just did a, a read or write and it took this many uh, milliseconds latency on, on that sector of this disk, uh, which is nice if you have a you know, a server with a lot of different, you know, disk spinning stuff. You can kind of see them all kind of going on at once. Um, let's see. I think in, around here, one of them, he has a, uh, um, it's, it's like anything that's like over a millisecond or something, it'll spit out. Let's see, there's another one that, CPU disk, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so if you ever want to see, uh, how, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, CPU scheduling events, you need to see that so you can kind of tell like what, which threads are blocked and whatnot. And you can just kind of tell you like how, how long each, each, each threads running. Mm 
need some another one here. It's good. I think this is the one. Yeah, this is the one I think Brendan Gregg wrote uh, initially, I think for MySQL. Um, that tells you all of, well, actually you can, I guess, set it up now for Postgres too. And if you run this, it'll essentially log all of your uh, queries that go over length. And so you can uh, just uh, output a log that uh, for just the queries that are taking too long so that you can uh, get like full stack traces on, which is nice. And really everything that they've done for MySQL and Postgres, I mean, you could, you know, customize to your own application if you use the same tooling under the hood. Uh, let's see, where's that another one that's... EXT4 slower. So, so this one, uh, it basically looks at uh, file IO. Uh, so any... Uh, File I/O operations slower than ten milliseconds, it'll it'll pop them out here to your shell, which I mean to be useful. Let's see here. Oh, this is another good one. That's it's a uh, it, you uh, give it uh, um, a count of various functions and how many times they're used. Um, so you could, you know, go all the way up the TCP stack. What I'm trying to look here for is Java. I do calls. So here in this lib, lib uh, they store uh, more of their higher level stuff. So things that are gonna run against like a Java virtual machine or a Python virtual machine, or if you're on Rails or Ruby virtual machine. Um, and these uh, U whatever, they've actually instrumented them for uh, several different uh, higher level programming languages that are garbage collected. Um, so yeah, here they could do a, Let's see here, find a good example here. Yeah, here's some good examples um, for doing, you know, Python or Java Ruby tracing to figure out, you know, what, what's, what kind of latency you're getting. You can get flame graphs out of all of these languages, uh, Node.js. Um, if you ever see the, the flame graphs, is, is that Ustat, I believe? Ah, this is the, the memory usage. But so yeah, th this is the BCC tools, which it, it's a real pain to compile. Um, you have to have a lot of, uh, well, you have to have some kernel libraries in here to compile it. Um, it looks like, as I was reading through this, uh, it looks like Arch Linux seems to be the easiest if you wanted to to, to build your own. Um, uh, and there's just a, a ton of different talks out here. Um, one of the ones that I liked is this one. Uh, uh, she's an engineer at Facebook and she uses, uh, uh, she's on their Android team. And so uh, eBPF has now been ported to Android. Uh, and she uh, has a, a code snippet here that I almost linked to. Right there, no. if it would actually render here. The other um, but it, it's a, it's it's it's, just, it's a, what this is. It's a very simple kernel trace uh, that whenever a file uh, is opened, uh, it, it basically tells you who has the file handler. And so they, they had a, a sound file that, that uh, somebody wasn't closing the file handler on it, and this is how they they attributed it uh, with just like a two or three lines of a sorry four lines of eBPFC. Yeah, that's not. Sorry, YouTube. Um, yeah, we talked about. Let's see the other one. Where's the other one? So okay, so so Alexi uh, Starvaritov. I, I'm messing his name up really bad. He was actually the one who submitted the original EBPF kernel patch. Um, 
this talk isn't too bad, although it, it, it's it's a it, it, it's he's, he's in Seattle and it's much at a higher level. Um, this this page is really useful. Uh, so in the IOVisor BCC project, uh, they have a in the documentation, and this documentation is really good. Uh, they have a kernel versions, and so you can go through and look at your kernel version. And it will tell you exactly when they implemented a certain eBPF feature in the kernel. And so, you know, way, way back uh, in you know kernel three eighteen, they got the e the BPF syscall. Um, yeah, XDP is is uh, one of the the network packet filtering ones that got moved into the kernel. Um, some other ones that were. able to filter things. And BPF uh, actually has a ton of really efficient data structures uh, to pass between kernel space and user space. Um, and there's like a mapping that it uses, like it, there's, there's uh, hash maps, arrays of hash maps. Um, oh, here it is. And here's the different data structures that they've, they've added uh, over the years that you can use to, um, when you get this data to store it in. Uh, before you, you pass it out to user space and see it. And I believe this ring buffer just got added, like maybe this month. I've heard some interesting stuff about that. I haven't had to really get into it, but apparently it's like a lock-free ring buffer because I mean, you're, we're getting up to like having 64 cores now. So trying to get them all to spit thing out, out in order is, is increasingly hard. Um, Yeah, and here's just the, if you actually want to look into it, what the, the BPF data structures look like. Just, just a, lot of, a lot of structs and stuff. So. Oh, and also uh, people might not know is that you, you actually have parts of BPF that are used uh, by default in Docker uh, to lock down your Docker container, not to use certain directories on the host machine. Uh, and that's through this, uh, this sec comp uh, that actually has uh, eBPF under the hood that's actually locking it down on your system. And so if you wanted to do a, <laughs> to do a YOLO Docker container that has full access to your system, you just set that. There's, there's a couple other things it uses. I know there's like AppArmor and some other things that Docker has on there, but, but one of them that it uses is SecComp to like say, hey, you know, I have a, I don't want somebody to read my temp directory or my browser cache or something. You can, you can explicitly put that in a filter so that it, the Docker container can never load it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so Brendan Gregg has a book. Um, so there's actually a book that you could buy that has all kinds of, uh, I mean, he goes through each one of these scripts and uh, Amazon might have a table of contents here. It's about 50 bucks. Um, I, I haven't uh, bought it yet. So I was trying to get to the table contents here. Yeah, see, so he has it broken down by all the different, uh, you know, different parts of the OS stack, all the different, you know, probes and tracing that you can add. Um, down to you know, write it in C level versus the higher order BCC tools. So that's out there. Um, and there's also, I believe, an O'Reilly book uh, that is about ready to come out uh, called uh, Linux Kernel Observability or something like that. Um, yeah, this uh, this Linux tracing workshop uh, is from Goldstein uh, is really good to walk through. Um, especially these, uh, um, these different documentations he has. Um, and, and, and I believe this is eBPF from like three or four years ago, but I mean, he shows you how to take like a JVM if you're on a, if you're on a Java shop and get a, you know, flame graphs off of it and, and all the things you'd want to stoop on and, you know, for, you know, whatever your application servers are running on to get out everything you'd be interested in. Um, 
And uh, because these uh, eBPF programs uh, have to go through the verifier before they go on the virtual machine, um, they're extremely lightweight, um, well, less than 1% overhead for, for most things. Um, now there's even an R BPF that I've, I've been meaning to play with. It's a user space uh, BPF bindings for R that you could uh, you know, probably use for a lot of testing. Not R, but uh, Rust. Sorry, Rust. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, R would be a... I mean, yeah, you could use it. Yeah, you could easily use it to trace your R and see where your R is being slow or swifty. Um, I've actually been thinking about using it for some testing uh, for the core utils port to Rust, uh, the U utils report, just to make sure that it's not doing any system calls that you don't expect it to. And also just to look at like the, uh, the latency charts and stuff are uh, with the Rust port versus the GNU core utils to see, you know, where performance is bad or worse. Um, so with R, uh, I think I can answer where it's going to be slow. The answer is everywhere. <laughs> well, a lot of the R people are now moving to Julia. That's their new favorite. Oh, yeah, this, this is another... Uh, so uh, I don't know how many of you guys are into Haskell or whatever, um, but uh, mm -hmm. a lot of IO surface when you're testing, um, a lot of it's composable in, in Unix land. I mean, you can, you can shell pipe one thing or another, and you have what, your, your, standard, your uh, standard input, you have your command line uh, arguments, you have your uh, system variables, uh, the shell variables, uh, and then on the output, I mean, there's, you know, different files you have out and whatnot. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, you might think of EP, EBPF as a way at, at a kind of testing and getting at a lot of this. Because EBPF, it kind of allows you to, at, at runtime, uh, almost do what Haskell does statically in terms of uh, tell you that, hey, this function is doing some IO with the kernel. And so that you know that, oh, well, this function has a side effect because I'm, I'm able to see it with eBPF uh, and immediately uh, do something about it. Um, that might be an interesting project if, if someone ever gets bored is uh, take, all your, uh, take all your C uh, functions and uh, LCOV, uh, the Linux code coverage tool has a nice uh, annotation format, and you could like annotate all the um, all the functions in your code with their uh, operating system call service. Like, hey, this thing calls a write, this thing calls a read, and you could just see that uh, as you're browsing your source code might be useful. Because a lot of times it's not readily apparent that it's doing I/O under the hood. Um, think of some other things that I saw. I wish I had the link to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get too much in that. Oh, this is a really good talk. If, if uh, just to kind of, well, actually, before I get into that, um, there's a talk that uh, Grace Hopper did, uh, the, the godmother of COBOL or whatever. Um, they started talking about circuits. Uh, talking about what a nanosecond is, about a foot of wire, uh, and how when you're engineering, you kind of have to think about everything in terms of nanoseconds. How many feet is it between you and you know wherever you want your data to go? And at the speed of light, that's essentially uh, the latency cost that you're going to have to pay. So just keep that in mind whenever you're writing a system. I mean, e even if it, it's a you know an external hard drive that's a foot away from you, you're going to pay a minimum nanosecond latency every call to it. So, uh, but uh, this is the one that I, I want to show you. It's a, this is actually the CPPCon talk uh, this year uh, by Emery Berger. And uh, he has a tool in here called Cause. Uh, and what, do you, what, do you, what you do is you attach some probes uh, inside your, uh, I wish I had a link to the actual stabilizer, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, he has one called stabilizer and one called cause. And what he does is you can't really speed up your code because you're, we're not magic. We don't have, you know, we can't always just magically speed things up. And so what he does instead of speeding code up, he takes all the threads and he slows them down one at a time. And he does some statistical tests to see what happens when you slow down various parts of your code. And counterintuitively, sometimes uh, when you slow down certain portions of your uh, certain threads, it actually speeds up your code because there's less deadlocks. Um, so anytime you have a, a large uh, multi-threaded application using something like uh, Berger's cause library to kind of get at uh, where you're gonna get your most bang for the buck, uh, speeding or slowing down different threads and then using eBPF to kind of figure out, okay, what exactly is this thing doing to be slow or, or fast uh, by, by spying on it? Um, those two tools in common are, are very powerful. Um, and I don't think many people have really used the, the cause tool much, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, like he uh, annotated like uh, SQLite in like 20 minutes and found like a, uh, an uncertain queries, like he sped them up by a, a, an insane amount by getting rid of a lock that was misbehaving, so. Yeah, any other questions about eBPF or what it could be used for, what people are using it for? Um, just, I know as a, mm -hmm. just as a comment, uh, your uh, Emery, uh, uh, what's his name? I, uh, there was a reason why I thought he sounded familiar. He just gave a uh, presentation to the ACM a uh, couple months ago that uh, you can uh, watch. I'm putting a link here in the uh, may... the comments. Yeah, he, he's, he's out of UMass and his uh, student that wrote the cause tool, he's actually a professor at Grinnell if we wanted to ever invite him. It sounds like a plan to me. Um... Uh, the name oh, yeah. of that talk was uh, Performance uh, Really Matters. Yeah, it, it was the keynote of the CPP con this year. Um, and, and another one, uh, and I-, I oh, Same I talk. Say what? I would appear so, yeah. And another thing that uh, this eBPF stuff is probably useful for, but we haven't quite used it yet for that. Uh, is we're starting to figure out that the permutation in which we link things matters uh, due to cache efficiency. <coughs> so Facebook a couple years ago uh, came out with a Bolt tool. I believe it's like binary optimization of linking or something or other. Uh, and they actually use a, a graph coloring algorithm uh, after you've uh, ran your, your code with uh, profiling on. And it, it permutes uh, the linker so that uh, to optimize uh, cache efficiency between uh, modules that call each other, objects that call each other. And then Google, about two years ago or so, maybe a little longer, uh, they came out with uh, their own tool called Propeller. And what Propeller does is it takes all of your functions and it splits them into hot and cold sections. And so the, the cold sections are stored in a different place than the hot sections are. And so your actual hot code uh, shrinks a lot, which hopefully uh, falls into cache, assuming you're, you're just calling the hot code, not the cold code. Um, and you could use something like eBPF uh, to uh, really tell you where some of these hot spots are, where cold spots. So think about refactoring your code, like, you know, in terms of like just getting rid of whole things that the space is killing you. Because cache efficiency matters, e even in code. And who wrote Bolt? Facebook. Uh, Bolt was a Facebook team. And Propeller was Google. Uh, Google, yeah. Well, and it's I sort believe... of like a, a spinoff of, I mean. Well, it's Propeller reported actually... that Google has started using Bolt and then did their own thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a no brainer not to, I mean, because Bolt, all it does is permute the, the linking. So it's not going to hurt your code any. I mean, worst case, it can make it slower. Um, and Propeller, I think they actually committed uh, the hot and cold function splitting into LLVM mainline, I believe. Maybe GCC, I, I forget, but they, 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 they committed some of that already. That's in my uh, news bits. It just 
kind of is bubbling up right now, as in this week, that they're they're uh, proposing to upstream that into LLVM. Yeah, it, it's a very good feature if you have a lot of code that you never call. I mean, all you're calling is like one hot path and that's it. Especially if like an AWS Lambda function or something where it really just does one thing and the rest of the applications bloat, usually. Um, and, and you could actually uh, apply both of those. You could apply propeller and then after uh, you do the propeller optimization, you could then apply bolt on top of that. So. Yeah, unfortunately, most of my lambdas are uh, Python based. So you're already throwing performance out the window. Why? A lot of them call straight to C binaries. Sorry, that was somewhat sarcastic. Uh, mostly it's uh, running uh, straight up Python libraries that are uh, then hitting a database and stuff like that. So performance really isn't even yeah. something that matters. Yeah, most, most code that you're using on AWS Lambda or whatever, yeah, it's mostly I.O. bound usually. They have GPU clusters for doing GPU stuff and everything else is usually I.O. for batch. Let's do like large compiles or something. Although some of the stuff for lambdas with a uh, step function uh, fan out seems rather interesting. I just haven't gotten to the point where I, I can play with it yet. Yeah, so they don't have, uh, so both lambda and uh, oh, what's their container system serverless thing, uh, Fargate. I believe it has most of the EBF stuff turned off already. Um, but there are more programs out there to do user space eBPF like functionality. So, and I haven't uh, fired up an AWS Graviton instance to see how well this stuff is working with ARM. I, I mean, it's working fine on Android. So I'm, I'm assuming it, it works okay. But yeah, that's, that's basically all I have. So you're one. saying there's more in the user space utils that you haven't dug into. There's more out there that uh, showing the utility of what. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you this. don't have to have kernel support for some of this. I mean, you can you can spy. I mean, you can, you can, you can build like you know libc and stuff to spy on it for you. I mean, assuming you assuming you aren't calling the OS calls directly in Assembler, which would bypass any any user space stuff that you you, that you had to intercept it. And then, yeah, there's a lot of security companies right now that are coming out with uh, I, I guess like even like antivirus type malware detection stuff that you load as a uh, like you you pay a subscription. And then load their custom you know, EVPF scripts on your server's fleet. Um, I know some other companies are using it for data attribution, uh, so they can even have like uh, I think even part of it's cryptographically signed. So like every time a piece of data gets passed uh, all the way from like your you know your DB2 mainframe or wherever your your source of truth is all the way down to the, the different workers, you always know what the lineage is and you always have traceable security on it. And that's, that's due to doing a lot of the tracing stuff in, in the kernel space. Well, very cool, thank you. Yeah, so sorry I didn't have demos to run here. I, I wanted to, <laughs> I wasn't in the cards tonight. I, 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 try, I, I tried getting on, working on Google Colab, which is a Chrome OS, which I think they forked it off of Gen 2, kind of. But yeah, they, they had a bunch of stuff disabled in the kernel for their, uh, for their uh, serverless compute offering. And IWSL is still having compiler errors, so sorry about that. Yeah, there are many things about WSL uh, 2 that are both nice and terrible all at the same time. 
I've been rather happy with its uh, Docker desktop integration, so. Yeah, I wish I had space. I had to throw it all over to my D drive. Um, and then whenever I use Docker, it always wants to put it back on the C drive. I, I need to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, they, they really didn't do a good job of uh, being nice about how that interacts with Windows. It's better than WSL1 was, though. But WSL1 was slow. Like the WSL2, like I'm getting full speed compiles with like six cores. I was noticing a little bit of uh, uh, like with Docker when I was running like apt and stuff like that, where it was pulling across the network and some of those things performance wise, I was getting a hit, but not sure why. Yeah, I, I'm really it, like, and also uh, they bumped the, like the kernel version that I have is like really old. I think they bumped the latest uh, WSL2 release to 5.2 or something like that. I, I think I linked it in there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to try like the later kernel to see see what, what's now all of a sudden just working out of the box. Because I, I know a lot of companies